So, first of all, I just want to say, you know, I, that I'm standing on the shoulders of amazing collaborators. This year has, if anything, a truly collaborative journey of, yeah, learning together of how, you know, how we, how we can work online. I see actually Tim is in this picture. He's one of our, you know, people that we've been learning together with. He's here. Hey, Tim. Um, and yeah, I mean, we've just been, you know, learning together, like sharing best practices around how to do on learn online learning. Um, and these are a lot of the sort of co facilitators, designers that we've been running our online uh, trainings together with. And so, yeah, I just want to start by sharing my, you know, my context. Um, and um, yeah, I, before, before Corona came, I run a program where we train people in designing learning experiences, uh, not just learning experience, sorry, experience design, like designing meaningful experiences. Um, but we really make our learning, our learning, you know, these immersions into this like really immersive uh, thing here. This is a video from an immersion that I created in Brazil um, in this old coffee farm, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And was working with like scent designers, artists, uh, working with, um, yeah, like th th making these amazing sort of physical objects, and really making things like fully immersive. And so when Corona came around at first, for the first, you know, many weeks, I just said like, nope, that's not for me. That's not for me. I'm not going to do online learning. That's not like, you know, my thing, we were, you know, it was just about to go over to San Francisco and run an immersion there. And I was so, and I was like, no, it was so sad. But finally, after, after some, you know, some coercion, <laughs> I could say from different collaborators, um, we, I agreed to, yeah, try to do online learning. Um, and it's been amazing ever since. Um, this is the first thing that I did. I talked to my amazing colleague, Simon Cavanaugh. And he said, no, just try something, just try something. And so we just, okay, he's like, okay, fine. I'm gonna do something that's you know, close to my heart, um, designing for those you love. So I made this small, I spent four hours writing a description of a, a training that would be two times two, two hours or something calls. Um, and then I, I launched it to our alumni of our programs and 43 people registered in, in a day. And I was like, okay, cool. So then from then on, basically, we started to uh, really, um, yeah, be creating a lot of um, online programs. And I think what I want to, the, the point here that I've experienced this year is that when we're working, doing something unknown, um, getting into a new territory, it's really like action um, is super, super important when we're working in complexity that we just continue to learn and like take action and learn from learn from failing uh, as well, which certainly done a lot as well this year. So, all right, I now for the sort of meat of the, the presentation, I'm gonna actually, yeah, try to make this interactive. Um, so we have this model that we work with at the, uh, you know, at the Chaos Pilots, I, um, which is called the 5E model, which is a model for designing experiences, designing meaningful experiences. We, a lot of people use this for designing learning experiences, and we're going to talk about that in this context today. So very quickly, so you have sort of like the excitement, the way you get a, attracted to the experience, the entry, the way you enter into the experience, like going into the, the door of a restaurant. The engagement is like the main part of the, uh, like why you came to the experience. It's like, it would be the actual talk, talking that's happening here. The exit is the clear end of the experience and the extension is something that's sort of physical or digital object that sort of brings back the experience. So what I want you to do now is I want you to think about an experience that you're creating. So I guess a lot of you are designing learning experiences. So you could, it could be a workshop. It could also be a birthday party for your, you know, five-year-old kid or something. It, it, it could be just an experience that has, it has to have a clear beginning and a clear ending. Um, so I want you all to try to think, you know, just to think of 
a experience that when I'm walking through here, we can sort of, you can fill in um, together. So any, everyone have an experience? Something, it could be, yeah, an important meeting that you have next week. Um, it could be something, yeah, and then, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's sort of, I want really to get like feedback and talk to people, but there's too many people to talk to you all. Okay, well, let's just try it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. Um, so, I, so think of a concrete case that you're working on. And I would invite you now to sort of draw, just take a piece of paper if you have anything around you to just draw the five E's out. So draw like, the, you can draw like the excitement, the entry, the engagement, the exit, and the extension, just like put them across the top of your paper. Um, so just like very simple, just a sketch, anything's fine. And then as I'm talking now, I would love you to sort of, you know, go through. And when I, when I'm talking about the excitement, I'm going to give examples of excitements, then, you, then fill it in for yourself of what it, what excitement, the, what the excitement is for your case. In general, I was sort of like a hint is that most people go straight to sort of the engagement and don't actually think about how people become aware of the experience or what comes after at the end of it. Um, all right, let's try it out. And um, yeah, I'm excited to hear your feedback at the end. So first of all, the most important place to start is the meaningful outcomes. Like what is the goal of the experience that you wanna create? Um, and so I've really been doing some fascinating research now. Just, I started by just reaching out to our alumni um, and also, yeah, I've been doing liter literature review. Um, and some of the like sort of where there's a lot of um, alignment of meaningful outcomes that you can aim to create um, in learning experiences would be uh, mindfulness, allowing people to feel like uh, to feel that they have sort of control of their attention, their present play, obviously, like, and that's the thing where, you know, Zoom is, it makes it really difficult to really add play, but it's super important purpose, um, experience being part of a cause that is bigger than oneself. I, it's amazing the statistics now of like the younger generation, they want purposeful experiences more than anything else like that. Um, so really creating that and positive relationships, obvi obviously like generative ways to, to be together. Autonomy, we're gonna talk a lot about this later as well. Um, positive emotions, we have sort of this uh, there's a scientific measurement, which is like openness to experience. And you can increase people's openness to experience through creating positive emotions. So how do you really uh, inject positive emotions? And flow, this like really, you know, putting people in that, that sweet spot of challenge and something that they're good at. So um, all of that. So this is a, this is a, design of a learning experience that we've created. Um, it's three times two hours. Again, we're using the 5e model here. As you can see like the excitement, which is this sort of welcoming package people get, the entry, which is this first call. Then you have sort of like the engagement, which is really the body of the experience. You have, you know, the, the calls that happen. And then you finally have the exit, which is like the, the, the last call and, and then, um, an extension, which is a which is another which is a call with their um, a group that they were um, put into through the training, and yeah, so this is sort of just like you know I, I'm trying to make this pretty practical, I'll just show you some you know examples of how we do things. Okay, so this is the excitement. So now I I would invite you to think of the excitement for the case that you're that you're working on, or like um, and yeah, just. I'm going to, I'm going to speak, but just fill in your excitement phase. So this is actually in development. Um, I'm really excited about this. We're like changing the way that people apply to join our programs um, using this yeah, type form, which now has this chat based function functionality. So it really makes it like you're talking to someone as you're going through it. Um, and I think the, the thing to, that's really important in this like excitement um, phase and this sort of first, you know, getting people into a learning experience. I love Priya Parker. 
she has this amazing book, um, The Art of Gathering. And she has this, she's called it the 90% rule. 90% of what makes a gathering a success happens before it begins. So really thinking of how do you work with, with priming and setting the expectations in the right way and really making sure that pe the right people are there with the right mindset, right? Um, then you have the entry. So now I invite you to you know, think of the case that you're working with um, and think of the entry. How do people enter into it? So this is like, if you have like, a, this would literally be like entering into the Zoom room, right? Um, and this is sort of a mindset that we, we work with is that relationships are built from shared experiences. And so more meaningful shared experiences build in deeper relation, deepen the relationship. And some of the new neuroscience of learning is really showing that um, we we generate insights in much more effectively when we are shared, when we have these like positive relationships around us. So this goes to this point here of really connection before content in all of our online learning programs. We really um, do these, you know, connecting exercises. And there are some really amazing, creative, fun ways to do this um, before we get into the content of the design. Before so we get into the content in the entry, in the entry phase, I would invite you to think of like, how could you connect? How could you really focus on building relationships? The engagement, this is sort of like the, the main part of the experience that you're designing. It's like the main activities. If you're going to a restaurant, it would be like eating the hamburger or veggie burger or whatever you're eating. Um, at a learning experience, it's obviously like, you know, actually at, like in the, the, the training. Um, this is something I'm really, really excited about. I think uh, what one of the things that we sort of stumbled across in our exploration this year is really, really giving a lot of autonomy to, to learners. Um, as a way I sort of, it's almost like the way you need to be a facilitator online is like taking a step back. You're like one step meta because you can't be in the room with people. So, um, and, and in order to do that, you need to make things super, super simple. So I want to show you, this is an example of um, uh, a framework that we created. We were very inspired. We're standing on the shoulders again of, of Stanford. Stanford does these incredible, they do Stanford leadership labs. Um, and we were like making it, making it our own and, you know, citing their work uh, in the chaos pilots and making these design labs. And basically what it is, um, this is just like a video of going through the, the document that people get. So they get this very, very clear like overview of what the design lab is. Um, and, you know, then they get like a clear agenda. It's a two hour call. Uh, well, geez, I wish I could stop. I can't stop the video. Okay, so it's a, two, it's a two hour call. And then everyone, it's a group of five people and everyone gets 20 minutes. First, like a few minutes to present like a challenge. And then they sort of like turn off their video or block their video and the rest of the group gives them perspectives on their challenge. And then they sort of come back and say, Hey, this is what I heard from you. Anyway, the point here is that it's a super, super clear format, um, which can be replicated. Right. So in terms of online learning, I think it's a huge potential that we can sort of really, really scale meaningful, um, learning through creating really, really clear, good formats that, that, um, so I'm not, I'm not in the room. I'm not, I just create the context, um, uh, you know, host the space and give, and then give them this format. And then the group is in their own WhatsApp team and they have to find a time themselves to have the call. They have to prepare for the call here. You can see there's detailed instructions on how to prepare for the call, detailed instructions for how to take notes, blah, blah, blah. Um, we've got amazing feedback. People have said, like uh, the people that have done this, we've only uh, run this training one time. So I'm really excited for the next time as well, um, that they're continuing to do the calls after the training is done because they found it so valuable. Great feedback. Anyway, I think there's a lot of potential in that way of working online. Yes, so that's in summary, give learners more autonomy. And I think there's, yeah, then, yeah. The exit. So this is the now. Please go back to your case. Think of how you can like have it end in a really, really good way. Um, 
again, this is sort of this, this is a Daniel Kahneman Nobel Prize uh, winner. His research found that we really, really remember the peak and the end of an experience. It really makes sense from a biological perspective. You think of like an organism that needs to survive in a hostile environment. They need to remember how an experience ended. So let's say that I ran into a bear. I was like, did I, was it, was it great? Was he nice to me? Did he give me a hug or did he tear off my arm? <laughs> and if he tore off my arm, I really need to remember that, right? And like warn the other people around me that don't mess with bears or whatever it is, right? So there's a, it's deeply wired within us that we remember the end, like the, the, how things end. So really important when you're designing learning experiences to think about how, how things end. Um, and finally, we have the extension, which is a digital or physical object that sort of extends the experience. So think for yourself, with your case, what could the extension be for, for your case? Um, just give an example. This is an amazing, so this is like, this also goes into the connection before content. And also ooh, another element of you know, like making good experiences is like this storytelling, which is essentially just building, you know, tension. So this is a amazing, this is one of my favorite exercises I've found um, to do an online facilitation, which is you put people into groups, uh, into pairs, they get to know each other, then you bring them back and you have them write a haiku about that person. So actually in this case, because this is a, I was, run, I was running a training about meaningful experience design. We had them tell stories about a meaningful experience. Then they wrote haikus to each other about um, yeah, like capturing the other person's story. And I had them do that at the beginning of a two hour session. And then building the tension, uh, didn't, didn't have them share it with their partner until at the very, very, very end of the call, I say like, okay, now, like we, we, I had worked with a tech team and they have created a WhatsApp group for everyone. So now at the very end of the call, please share your haiku. Um, and so this is like, then people are just writing, like we're transitioning from Zoom to our sort of uh, WhatsApp group, which will be how we communicate in between calls. And then people are writing their, their haikus here. Um, and there's, yeah, it's just really beautiful adding this sort of like, you know, yeah, lit quite literally poetry to the learning environment. Um, and again, also like integrating the different platforms. So thinking of how Zoom can connect to WhatsApp as an example. So, yes. Yes, summary of that whole of the extension of the, the um, exit and the extension is that endings matter. So there we are. There's the 5 view model. I hope that you were able to um, put in, you know, like actually get some insights as to, you know, different areas of the experiences that you're working with creating. Um, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Anna, am I okay? How's the time? You are doing wonderfully with time. So we have about five minutes now okay. for questions, also a little bit more. So if you have any questions for Andy, um, please put them into the chat or if you're filling up to it, um, you can also unmute yourself and just ask it directly. Cool. I can stop sharing so i have some question i was the part of this training and it was incredible Im amazing uh, experience for me and we still continue with uh, my design lab meeting so it's each first sunday uh, we meet ourselves and we help <coughs> to build our uh, businesses or communities and for uh, the question from me is about designing experience uh, but can I apply this? Um, can I apply these tools or uh, apply this theory uh, into each experience that I will conduct? So, for example, if tomorrow I will have live on the Facebook, which will last I don't know thirty minutes, it's fine to use the the arches, or it's only for some longer training. Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, so. First of all, so good to see you. And, um, yeah, but thank you so much. Um, and I'm so happy that you're still doing the design labs. That's amazing. Like it's like totally warms my heart. Um, and yeah, I would say like, I, one thing I love about, you know, it's sort of working with arches in a way is that um, 
you can, you, there really can be fractal in a way. So you could say like the overall excitement for work, for, for learning um, or like for the chaos pilots as an institution um, is sort of like we have these like guiding purpose or guiding, you know, core meanings we're trying to make people feel. But then under that, you could have like one Facebook live session which you could then design in detail. You could also have other sessions which you can design in detail. So um, yeah, so how can you, yeah. So what the end, the sh yes, maybe I'm making it more confusing than it has to be. The short answer is that you should be able to design like uh, using the 5e, um, you know, in most cases, even for very short, for short times. Obviously there's some times where like the excitement and the entry are one thing when like if you like a flash mob would be an example of it where an excitement and entry are the same thing and sometimes there's not an extension if it's like facebook live like but it still helps like i think to think about how do people get into the experience generally and how do they like what happens afterwards like beyond it but thank you so much Thank you, Angelina, for the question. We have time for one or two more questions. You can feel free to put it in the chat or just simply unmute yourself. So, and I love the haiku. I'm definitely going to try that out. <laughs> it's a wonderful idea. I can give you detailed instructions here. I can share in the chat. There's an incredible resource um, called Play on Purpose which uh, yeah, they have like detailed facilitation instructions for online learning. You have to pay for it, but it's worth it if you do this professionally. That sounds wonderful. And there was also a question if um, you could put the, the learning lab or the design lab into to the chat. Um, there was a lot of interest in it. Yeah, I don't, yeah, that's actually, I mean, I, I have it as a, as a PDF, but I don't, it's interesting, like I, um, yeah, I don't know how to how I can share that exactly with you. So if you have it as a PDF, if people write you on LinkedIn, maybe, yeah. possibly. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's a good. That's a all good right. Tip. So we have a question here um, from David, and I'm not gonna attempt on the surname. David, do you want to unmute yourself and maybe ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for the presentation. Um, the question I have is, how do you help people, or if you help people transition from arch to arch, um, do you let them know that they're transitioning from kind of one arch into the next arch or from face to face? How does that work? Um, yeah, uh, it's pretty limited time. I think normally we spend a lot of time focusing on like the meaningful outcomes part of it, which is sort of like, it should be like a red thread that holds the whole, all of the, the excitement entry and engagement like together, right? So you have sort of like one core theme, like here we're talking about learning experience design. So like, I shouldn't just start talking about frogs. That would be weird, you know? So I think in, in the sense that like, um, it should be coherent. There should be a coherence between the different arches. Um, yeah, I think there, there's, it's very dependent on what the experience is because sometimes it can be really powerful to like, okay, now we're in the main room and now we're gonna transition into breakout rooms. And like thinking about that flow is really good. Like how do you also like break it up so it's not monoton monotonous and it's like one thing, um, but it should flow generally. Thank you so much, David. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. I can see no more questions in the chat. So we are keeping very good with time. Um, so thank you very much for the presentations. Um, looking very much forward to, to play with purpose. The link that you're going to share, that sounded like a, a lot cool. of fun. All right, um, I guess the, the, we can't really applaud in person, but if everyone is doing like this and we are applauding digitally, this is how we celebrate at least these days online. Thank you very much, Andy. And then Ole, the stage is yours. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. I uh, will piggyback right into that. I, I'm, a, I'm a third year uh, chaos pilot as well. So uh, early, early, early days. That's definitely part of my background. So 
uh, the, the, the topic that I'll talk about is exponential learning, uh, visual uh, teachers plus visual um, students equals exponential learning. And I think my first years have been at the Chaos Pilots and I also took some time uh, researching and writing about organizational learning and adult learning. And, and uh, at the moment, what we're doing in the company that I am part of called Bigger Picture, we are trying the best we can to bridge the gap that I'm just going to show you. And my, my, what I'll cover is an example of teaching and training and inviting everybody in a virtual meeting uh, to collaborate visually together um, by doing uh, the practice of drawing or visualizing in digital remote meetings, something very comfortable and analog happens. You know, some of the examples Andy just said, the, I love the haiku as well, a physical, of something that connects people in a way that we're now sitting in our 2D spaces. Uh, we can show each other uh, pens or stuff we can have. All those things are important for learning. So our, our approach in bigger picture is, is, um, is visual collaboration. And um, now I'll just share with you my uh, screen here. So hopefully you're seeing a gap um, from two sides on the canyon. Is, that, is there a gap with a red dot? Yeah. Yes. So the, the main, the point is that if you see this as a teaching organization, uh, teaching situation, you could have the teacher going blah, blah, blah in the old days in a physical space. It could be that the lack of concentration is, is uh, out the door because we're, we're really in all different, we're not paying attention. So we work with teachers and educators and this is a normal physical educational setting. So we're saying that, that by, by giving everybody the skills to visually create uh, content together is really important. If, if we give the tools to the teachers, students, everybody who's participating in physical meetings at the moment, as where I'm, what I'm talking about, then we have collaboration in a different, uh, in a different way. So I come from a, 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 the chaos pilot background where we always mapped up stuff, did systems thinking, did mapping all over the place on the, on the wall space. And, and this kind of collaboration is, is new uh, in a way, but it's not new at all. Cave paintings are big maps on the wall. So, so the, the, the part that we're seeing and that we've then done a little bit of work on uh, to, to help teachers and educators, oh, sorry, uh, move a little bit better into this space is we try to bridge this gap of going old style collaboration into that new style. And, and the main thing that was a challenge was to, to um, to actually grasp that we can all work visually together. Now, in the beginning, that was built on a model that I'm just going to speak to here as a physical environment. And again, Andy, you talked about how you do these things when you're together. Well, how do you move that online? I'll get to that. So what we, what we built was a systematic approach to being visual together in meetings. And the foundation is system theory because that gives us the second level group learning and understanding of communication as a way to discuss how groups learn. And when we know that groups learn through communication, we need to pay attention to observe and visualize that shared, that shared knowledge up on the wall. So that's what we call a visual learning arena. So when we, when we put stuff up on the wall, I, uh, let's say we have a, an, a, an agenda and we see it, we have a SWOT, uh, we might have a mind, mind map and a flip chart. We might have a business model canvas. Um, we might have visual structures that support the shared communication. So those three layers become important when we think about learning together. Now, that's easier said than done when it's, uh, um, when, when it's digital. So I just want to move up to uh, this part here and say, well, it actually doesn't change the moment you think of a learning situation and a learning environment that's online. This is the situation most people are now finding themselves in, but it doesn't change that we're sitting at home or we're sitting in our spaces and we're having a challenge to figure out how to learn together. But if you as a learning designer, you think of that physical learning arena, you still need to have your agenda up on the wall somewhere in a, in a virtual collaboration space. You still might to do a, want to do a SWOT and a brainstorm. You still might want to do, let's say, the business model canvas again. You might want to have these learning arenas, scaffolds that can help the group when they're now moved online, still have a shared space and a shared view. Um, 
So what we're doing now at this meeting, this meetup, we have a visual a mural where we all can contribute to. It's a structured method, a systematic way to put stuff up visually and, and map our knowledge. And that does something with the learning. Now, the part that we've tried to do, because we want this to be easy for others, we want to sketch quickly. So we've built this bridge of five building blocks. And the one is discover a visual language you see to the left. That is uh, getting people to draw very basic, very simple. Uh, the second is design your collaboration process, a little bit like Andy said with the artists, think through your process. And the third is make sure you know what you're going to talk about. Like be really harsh on defining those key questions that like pearls on a thread, make up your process, whether it's a two hour thing or a seven month thing. And that leads you to the force building block, with, which is create engaging templates. With the icons, with the language, visual language you have, your process and your questions, you now have those things that make up your learning space, be it physical or be it digital. So as a, as a, as a facilitator, but also as a trainer, how do you create those things on the wall that helps the students learn? And in the end, how do you scale your training or your education? How do you use visuals or, or how do you make this something that others can use? Now, to zoom out completely on this, I'm going to hope that you can follow that, um, the thinking now. This, this approach is, is not new in a way. It's a little bit more systematic than some of the things that are out there, but it's one way of doing it. And we, we've been training teachers of higher education and uh, primary education and, and so forth. Um, and the part that I want to show you now is here's now this um, of meeting space. So I'm zooming out to an online space, like a visual learning arena for teachers coming into a workshop that's called visual teachers plus visual students equals exponential learning. And the idea here is that I'm inviting 25 participants into a shared journey where they're going to learn to work visually so that they can invite their teachers, their, their students into the virtual space to work visually with them around any given topic. The agenda could look like this, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit that we have, in our case, we have a workshop where we have some exercises, we do theory, we share. In this space, I share with the participants what we're going to go through during these four hours. And at the end, we are ready to go into the workshop. If I zoom out, you can see in the bottom, the space is, there's a path. So we are using a visual metaphor for a journey for the four hours together. And at the bottom of the screen, we're using the visualization of five tables with each a dot for each representation. So we're, we're moving the, the physical space into an online 2D to the best we can to make a little bit of a resemblance to how people, oh, now we're there. Okay, I'm in group number one. So I'm in group yellow, I'm yellow group. In, in round one, we're going to map these questions. I, I won't go into details about this. Um, in round two, no, we're, we're going to have yeah. these questions. And then what I want to say on the um, last bit here is we then spend time to equipping everyone with uh, this new language. So we teach people to do very basic shapes of drawing. We help people draw people uh, or draw places just some very basics so that they can draw any learning process they want. And by do, going through just something like this, uh, it's a 30 minute training or 15 minute training in very simple drawing, using colors, using some uh, effects. They are then ready to put this together. For example, here, we're saying, put it together in a strategy picture of where you are today, A to the left, where you want to go tomorrow, B, 2030 the challenges and then the solutions. Or if you're a teacher, you might wanna do a course overview. So in the top, you have the arrows of the different sequences, group work, and the bottom, you have the journey that's drawn out of what is the journey you're inviting the students on. But by doing this, we've just touched the surface, uh, scratched the surface on how can you then use visuals? For example, but we, we want teachers in this kind of workshop to say, what visuals do I need? So let's map all the words in a systematic way that we need to visually depict and, and help our students have of a visual vocabulary 
a new language to better collaborate, to better communicate, to better think together. And we spend time grabbing some tools, using them to come up with that visual language that the students use, uh, that, that the teachers want to use. And then in the third round, I'll just give you an example here. Group, the yellow group started, they had an assignment just to play with what could you, what do you want to visualize of your journey? So having just a half hour teaching in basic visuals, they started to do their journeys visually depicted in a simple way. Uh, here's another one. So some basics, and of course, this is just scratching the surface, but the idea is that we're in this course about becoming a visual teacher and equipping your students so they're visual so that you can move faster with the topics that you need to, um, to get uh, around. I'm just taking a break. I said that was the, that was the, that was the, so a little bit of time out and that was the overview of an idea of getting online with a way we normally did something physically, but both places, physical workshops and digital workshops use this power of the visuals. I'm going to jump into two cases and then have invite anyone to put in uh, remarks in the chat, but also if you want in the collaboration space that we have in the mural, we'll talk to that. But how much time do I have, Anna? Let me just check here. Um, two more minutes for your presentation, but feel free to, to spend a little bit more time. Um, uh, after that, that there's questions. Okay. But... <laughs> that would be okay. That was a run through of, of the basic idea and then this thing. I want to share as the last bit, I just want to share that when we then move a little bit into the big picture, here's a overview of how we together with some, you can see it's a case of a Danish MIT, the DTU in Copenhagen, uh, the five year, fifth year graders, uh, fifth year, the last year students uh, went into a three uh, module course where the whole program was visualized and it became their scaffold, their, their way of looking through how how their training uh, was, what the room setup was, how they would work through week uh, one with day one and two, week three, day four and five, and so on. We also uh, visualized for them how, how would, what would the exam look like. So they already in the beginning knew what the end goal was. Um, now that's one version. It's it's drawn a little bit nicer with a graphics expert, but the idea is the same that anybody can depict their systems overview. But the other case we did is we then trained 960 ninth graders in the Danish municipality of Gentofte to, uh, for their project work, to also use these very simple, create a visual language together. When they do project work together, use it and use the mapping on the walls. That was a physical way. That was before the current corona situation. And finally, the, the teachers, so we created, with the teachers, we created a half-day training concept so they could teach class after class, year after year, to prepare in a more visual way, the way the, their approach to their project. And now I just want to zoom back into the space we have together and say that really as a learning, I think, nerd, uh, looking at the journey that we've uh, uh, just played with for this meetup, the point is that as a scaffold for our learning, if we move into these uh, virtual spaces, some examples that are really working well are murals or mural boards, where you make a simple structure, you invite people in to post it, use color codes or drawings, and you create a, a, a metaphor, like in this case, again, the journey, where you meet four presenters, and that becomes a very memorable outcome. But of course, it needs to be designed. It needs to be used. People need to be used to the new technology and need to have the, 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 the tech set up to do that. Now, that's a different question that's really very relevant. But I'm just going to leave you with an uh, invitation to uh, ask any question. And if you are in the mural, uh, put a green post-it note, a yellow post-it note, or a blue post-it note. And then now it's time for a handful of, um, of questions to anything of uh, what, what I've just been through. And I hope that was, um, it made sense. That was wonderful, Ole. Um, I can see already in the chat, Joanna had a question. Joanna, do you want to maybe um, unmute yourself and ask? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. I guess that uh, she's with Eric, so. Ah, right, so. That might be the thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Ole says here, dear Ole, could you please give us some tips from your professional point of view for designing learning experience for people, adults, who don't have any or limited experience as participants in trainings or workshops or learnings beside classroom experience in formal educational settings. They are a little bit reserved or reluctant to participate, open or share their thoughts, struggles, questions, or use their undiscovered learning style. Thank you. So from Joanna. So, um... So I, I'll address it in probably two ways and whether one of them are the right one, uh, leave it to you. But um, I understand it as we, we would, I, I would, um, to people who are new to any learning um, experience online, if that is the, the main question, I would, I would always uh, take very small steps and really like a ping pong uh, invite in for a journey and start the journey by a very simple question and by the feedback we're getting be ready with two or three next steps different next steps that are then uh, a, a degree deeper and and build that in so the trust and the interest and I'd say the excitement if I borrow the the five e's the excitement is kept and sustained and built upon um, as, as we do a lot with visuals, we would, for those who don't think visuals are relevant for them, we would show how easy it is and do it in a fun, uh, fun way that actually is helpful and they could use right after a session. So each of these small steps that become deeper and deeper, it would be very good to design it so that they can, it's valuable for them right back into their environment from where they're coming, regardless of their experience with learning uh, sessions online or remote. And Ole, quick question, which uh, hardware are you using in order to make these beautiful hand-drawn characters? Can you do that in, in Mural? Uh, so yes, um, it's a very simple hand-drawn, so anybody I would believe could do it. Uh, Mural has a pen, so I'm, I'm simply sitting at a laptop with a laptop that does have a multi-touch and I have a pen and I can click on the drawing device and then I can sit and draw right into the, um, the, the mural. Very nice, probably takes a bit of experience, but good to know that it can be done that way. Um, I can see Liana, um, you had a question in the chat. Do you want to unmute yourself? If not, I'll, I'll no, read no, it as well. No, no, I a question. I, I just came in, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> What's your yeah. question? I had a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Anna. Uh, so I was wondering um, what your experience um, with tools like Mural was in the sense if you ever had a feeling that participants were overwhelmed by, you know, having to learn how it works and find things and actively engage themselves. Because, for example, we use some very simple tools like Zoom for webinars. Sometimes participants are overwhelmed by, I don't know, using the chat or a whiteboard and Zoom is already too much. So how, how do you deal with this? Um, good, very good question <clears throat> and very relevant. Uh, so the example is what we're doing right now. We are 60 at the, at, the, at the meetup now. And let's say there's around 12 people who have moved themselves up. So you can't throw out a link and make this important uh, and, and make, uh, you know, uh, make it count in a setup like we have right now, because it takes time to get mm -hmm. on board. It takes, uh, you know, it's just like an alphabet. You, you, need, you need to learn it slowly. So an organization needs to decide that this is a way we're going to do it. What I do think is possible if you introduce Mural or Miro or any or the other is that you don't need others to jump into the board but you can facilitate a conversation like Anne is doing and you ask and you have a support who is uh, taking notes into the mural board. And you, at mm -hmm. the end, you will have a visual output that people have seen come to life and they can see possibly some of their comments put into it, maybe even some of it visualized. So many, many of the, uh, I know uh, the, 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 the networks I'm in, they use professional illustrators who are also visualizing. But 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 it's uh, it can be a show uh, stopper, 
uh, that mm. you put on too much and people just, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't want to do this. I don't have a voice. Uh, I don't feel listened to. Mm -hmm. I'm not in. And then you, you're off. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much for <laughs> the input and the answer. Are you welcome. All right. We have a new, very good question in the chat. Milan, do you want to mute yourself and ask? Sure thing. <clears throat> so basically, since a lot of our workspaces are one and the same as the spaces that we live in, unconsciously or subconsciously, there's still a lot of different experiences anchored in this place that might make it harder for people to engage in a given experience. And I'm wondering what we could do as facilitators to maybe make the experience more real as something distinct from the space that it's occurring in, like maybe like some sort of onboarding ritual or some sort of thing that just lets your, your mind and body know that you are getting into that learning mindset? Uh, that's a good question. I think mine, my answer would be, just to, well, there are many different examples. So I, I think everybody here might have uh, solutions to that. Just this morning, we did a workshop where a part, one of the participants uh, did, did physical exercise with whatever you had in your room. So everybody was suddenly doing in a physical exercise with some he something heavy in their in their space and that that created a connection that i think personally is important and i think it's very interesting aspects of seeing everybody here you know our different environments what we have in the background uh and and i, I would uh, i i think uh, bringing it in and taking time for for that so we get a sense of shared space even though we're 20 different ones to, to, or how many we are and that goes for the physical space, but also for the mind space, may, maybe having moments where we do something as a check-in or as a, as a way to enter, um, enter the meeting uh, on an on equal uh, wavelength as, as much as we can, knowing that we're also more so than ever, we're meeting multicultural um, groups of people who have very different ways of joining a meeting, listening in, contributing, and so on. I don't know, Milan, if that was uh, the, the, the answer, but, but that was uh, just a couple of thoughts based on what you said. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. A lot of things to, lot of things to reflect upon. Nola, how, how do you work with people who come into one of your workshops and saying, I'm not creative and I cannot draw? Um, then we show the some of the drawings that you just saw, uh, and, and we we ask everybody to sit with a pen and a post-it note or a piece of paper, and draw those very very basic shapes. And by by doing a couple of combination of those shapes, we show them how they can make a very com complex story told with with one one drawing. And then we say, uh, give a couple of examples of why visual communication helps us see what each other means. And, and then we test it out a little bit and we show that we draw really, really bad ourselves. And therefore there's nobody who, who, who should be, um, there's not, it's not a skill level to draw 10 lines on a piece of paper that, but, but um, there's, a, there's one thing that's a thinking, of the, like visual thinking tool and the other thing is a visual presentation tool. So some people want it to look really nice and they have in mind, how do we get, I can't make something that I can go and show either the boss or the teacher or the board. So, so we need to talk, that, talk about the sketching is a thinking and collaboration, uh, unfinished kind of work. Uh, and it's not going to be the finite. Then, it's, then it often becomes the finite because those simple sketches are very human, uh, very analog and, and uh, very authentic. And in a, in a cluttered digital space, that just, that becomes the visuals that people remember. And therefore mm -hmm. that's sort of the resounding feedback. Oh, we use those drawings and those are the one people talked about. I really like that human and authentic um, <laughs> trumping perfection these, these days. This is really nice to hear. I can see Petra, you had a question as well, if you want to ask it on. If you can unmute, will you still unmute? Oh, we still can't yeah. hear you? Yeah, I, no. yeah. I just wanted to know when, when you're finished with group, how long do you keep the board open? Uh, at the at the moment, forever and ever. 
Um, we we are our courses. They are still open uh, half year after. If mm -hmm. there's a workspace, we keep a backup. Uh, we also write a little bit of a hint that please keep the board as is, unless and and add rather than delete. Uh, we do have a board, so everybody gets a PDF. Um, but but as we grow in boards, we will take them down. But everybody everybody gets a PDF after, and we give a warning. Uh, make sure that you grab whatever you need to grab. And if there's personal stuff inside, photos or something, we have an upfront uh, agreement that this is for those who participated. And you can't share anything unless you get written permission from those who are you were in your group or workshop. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more question. Is there any special apps that you can recommend or like to, to start drawing digitally? Uh, we have used, uh, so if you're a PC person, it's, it's a OneNote. Uh, OneNote goes on it, but it, they also go on the, uh, the, the different devices these days. Um, we use Mural and Miro, and Mural is more clunky when it comes to drawing. Uh, then we use a PC and it doesn't, you don't, at the moment, you don't draw on Macs. But uh, iPad Pros, they do come with the app. So on, on our devices, the phones and the, the tablets, we have Miro or Mural or uh, Sketchbook Pro or brushes, uh, depending on how quickly we need to sketch. Um, so, so those are the, uh, a couple of ones. We do not have external uh, boards. We, we want to draw like on paper on screen, not externally where you just look at the screen and then you draw on your hand, your hand on the side. That just doesn't work, but that's a personal thing. Great. All right. Gao Rao, or you will first have to correct me on how to pronounce your name. Um, you have a question. Hi, this is Gauravya. Uh, don't know you pronounce it quite well. So uh, thanks for the presentation. Just so uh, uh, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, how do you handle this, the challenge of where your audience really belongs to different cultures, different backgrounds, where symbols, metaphors could mean something totally different. They, they, have their, they come with their own cultural baggage. So how do you kind of get alignment in, in such cases when you are, when, whether it's either through a presentation or roadmap or some such, you know? Uh, um... Well, that's a very good question, and it's a very, very important one to to uh, to, to to take very serious. Um, we worked in Palestine, in U in the Ukraine, in in, in the U.S., in, um, in 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 Namibia. We we worked uh, many different places, and I think one of the beautiful things about visuals is that every culture was visual before they were text. So, uh, if you ask any any anyone, that's my experience, anyone from any culture to say. What did you visualize? What what hangs on your what hang on your walls at home? What stories did you have? What what are what what were the how were they visualized? I grew up in Kenya, and we we uh, a couple of years in Kenya, we had a we had some uh, um, some fables that were just very very different from what I was brought up with. And, and I think uh, by by bringing those different ways of using visuals into the mix and acknowledging that they're different is very important. But there are also things in certain cultures, cultures you, of course, don't illustrate. There are certain ways you use color, yeah. uh, and you need to be very aware of that. And also, if that is counterproductive uh, or you're just bumping into something you didn't understand. I, I for sure, have done that uh, by drawing something that was not, uh, not, not supposed to be drawn um, or, or visualized. And we had, and we had something, but, but that then, uh, depending on, again, what culture, that became a a thing that was talked about or a thing that was does not talked about. Again, it, it depends. So um, uh, we've tried in our book to give a, a hint on, on, on some of the color codes that exist in different cultures and just being aware of, of that and know it if, you, if you're into a group and ask, ask people to say, to, to bring something that visually makes sense to them. Thank you. <clears throat> really interesting question. All right, so we are staying with time. So thank you so much, Ole, for your presentation. I also put the link to your um, Bigger Picture website where you have a fantastic academy where you can take lessons. So let's all give a virtual applause for Ole. <laughs> thank you very much, Anna. Fantastic.
to have you and I'm really looking forward to see how our mural board is uh, shaping up now after your presentation as well. Everyone feel free to go in there, play around at your insights. All right, then next we are moving on to Gru Gulberg. Gru, are you with us? The stage is yours. Just checking if I can find I saw quite earlier. All right, quite you are possibly still on mute. Um, Queen, do you hear us? If so, maybe you can just Put a hello in the chat. Just as a backup, Sandra and Yuri, would you be ready to jump in while we're still? There might have been something happening. Yeah, we can go if, okay. if uh, you need us to, sure. It might look like that. I'll ping in the in the background. So Change our plans, Yuri and Sandra. Um, stage is yours. Okay. All right. So we'll jump in. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anne, for the invitation. And I'd like to shift gears a little bit and um, invite everybody to just stretch a little and remember that you have a body. Because mm. the tendency, I guess, from our perspective is that in front of screens, Sometimes uh, we tend to forget. If you want to stand up a little, you can, and then just move, move your body a little and then sit back down. <laughs> so this is something we, we used to do where uh, we had never done like long courses online before the uh, pandemic. And so we, changed everything we, we brought to online everything we used to do in person and we are we intend to share a little bit of our experience doing that here with you all we don't have all these wonderful methodologies that they presented before we just have <laughs> our own way of doing things and how we are adapting and learning as we go and trying new things and experiencing and so this is one thing like just remember we have bodies for example <laughs> it's one thing that we are always inviting people to do maybe when we are long time sitting in front of the computer like three hours or four or more yeah mm -hmm. and uh and as uh was presented we work a lot with nonviolent communication and we used to um, do a lot of in face-to-face um, -face, uh, workshops. Uh, there are several people here in the group that have done workshops with us um, when it still was face-to-face -face, and also long retreats. So there was a challenge for us how to, how to transfer that experience to an online environment um, on that level. We had already had the uh, experience with doing online work with nonviolent communication, but then in that intensity, there, there were several questions and challenges that uh, came up. So before we dive into anything, I actually would like to invite for another very uh, short practice to just, if you'd like to take a few breaths and if, if you feel comfortable, please just close your eyes while you're doing that and shift your attention inside. Just uh, look inside and while you're breathing and notice what, what, is your, what is your state right now like? What are you noticing? And as soon as you're ready, as soon as you've done several breaths and you're ready to come back, I'd like to invite you to just type into the chat one maybe one main word of what you've noticed of how you are right now. How are you feeling? How? And just type in 
into the chat. It could be more than one word if you'd like, but you can reduce whatever you notice of how are you right now? How are you feeling? What are you noticing in yourself? So there's a lot that's coming up already. Um, relaxed. Inspired, relaxed, bubbly. Um, happy to see you. Sandra Nuri, hungry and curious, calm, warm, happy, caged, anxiety, anxiety, mm. excited, tired, mm. tired of sitting, visualized, enthusiast, feeling cognitive overload, thankful. <laughs> <laughs> mm, thank you. Thank you thank for you. engaging back. And this is already one of the things that um, we'd like to start with. So we've, we've we were discussing what we wanted to share with you, and we thought of three main, uh, three main points, maybe, or, or areas that we thought are significant or important in that experience in, in thinking that uh, transferring the face-to-face -face experience to online experience. And the first one we thought was connected to exactly the inner experience, the inner state of myself as a facilitator as somebody who is holding space online and um i'm saying this because this is this is something that is already tremendously important in face-to-face -face work and um uh there are dimensions and and maybe subtle aspects of this that are not always that obvious of their impact in how 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 they're impacting the space that we're holding and the processes that we're trying to support uh, while we're facilitating. So when I'm thinking of my own self-awareness as a facilitator or a leader, maybe of a team uh, or a facilitator of a course, there are different things that could be hijacking my quality of presence. And that will definitely um, impact the the way that I'm able to hold whatever is coming up or the process or keeping an eye on the objective on the goal or the phases or whatever it is that I'm doing with the group. So just um, um, there are different things that I might want to just become more aware of about myself of what, what triggers me and what puts me in a reactive um, uh, mode and notice if there's there if there's something that, maybe someone who's speaking too long, or if the meeting is losing focus, or if um, the meeting, um, the time meetings, is, the time for the meeting is almost up, and things like that that might hijack my awareness and I get into a reactive state. And so the own self-work of myself as a facilitator of how to come back, how to anchor myself, and how to also use an element of transparency about what's going on for me and inviting people to um, understand what is it that is so important that I'm trying to hold can be tremendously effective in um, just engaging everyone, inviting everyone to, um, I'd say, become more into resonance, uh, achieving some level of resonance in the group. Uh, whether it is whether I'm trying to bring focus or something uh, in that sense. Do you want to maybe say more about this? Or? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm just concerned. So one of the things also that we were thinking about. Um, so there. So there are three main points. One is the inner aspect of the facilitator. The other one is the the relational aspect of how am I dealing with people on the call on the on the um, process or meeting or workshop or whatever it is. And um, another aspect is how am I weaving connection between people that are participating? How am I holding a space that helps people uh, really um, exchange, connect to each other, connect to themselves? How am I generating that in the field? So. And, and there's another aspect that uh, usually we co-facilitate everything we do. We, we are married and also we work together for over 10 years and we are married for 21 years. So this is also something that it's really important 
uh, in our work and as well as uh, when we work with another or with someone else, me with someone else or you with someone else to have uh, these like agreements or how do we engage with the group and how do we facilitate together and uh, so this is something we've been uh, learning a lot with the years within our own experience that we, we can support each other or we can disturb each other and and the opposite of supporting i don't know how to say that in english yeah, yeah. and uh, and disturb the process as well yeah. when we do that so and support mm -hmm. each other and the group or if we are not very well connected or if there's something that is not um so uh, we have to deal with that in order to to bring the whole group um, a better experience yeah. yeah and in that sense also it's worth mentioning that the fact that there's a dynamic also in terms of gender and how gender identities and power relations impact um our own interaction and this is our own personal laboratory also there's a little bit of that that we also make transparent to the group and try to hold um, how that is um, resonating also, because a lot of the topics that we deal with have to do with these challenges and how they manifest also in groups, how men to tend to talk more, take more space than women or, or a more diverse array of gender identities that are not just um, um, binary. Um, anyway, just... Uh, to mention a couple of things about then the relational dynamic. One of the things that is very core to nonviolent communication practice, and we noticed how that's, it comes a little bit natural to us and not so natural in other environments. Some, some do, but um, for other reasons maybe, uh, is the reflective listening, is how we are able to uh, bring in our own example in modeling the way that we um receive what people are sharing and sometimes it has to do with a, a very superficial or technical information and then checking understanding for example is something that can be really helpful not only for that person to feel received but also how that uh, resonates within the group and creates an atmosphere and a feeling of oh this is an environment where people are received and and there's there's another element also that when i when i check back when I um, rephrase, for example, and check my understanding, I'm not only doing it for myself, I'm doing it for the whole group. So there are different levels of how reflective listening uh, can have um, uh, the, this first, first uh, several, uh, couple of benefits, but also the fact that we're modeling it is also a way that when we're starting to invite people to do that, they've already seen that happened several times. They've uh, sensed the texture and what, what it feels like, what it looks like. So when they're invited to do that later, when we're trying to help people weave connection between themselves, uh, amongst themselves, that's also not so foreign and, and, and starts to become part of the culture of what we're doing together for the time that we're spending together. Is there maybe something um, more? Uh, I, I really enjoyed seeing the, the other three previous two presentations and all of the uh, design and visual aspects that we used to do that uh, in person and online it's been a challenge so I'm re really excited to try some of those things and to learn more about that because this is something we're not doing, uh, we're really not doing actually with, with mm -hmm. images, but we do uh, invite people to share Google Docs, for example. So everyone goes to a, a doc, uh, shared document to co-create it, to do something together or write things on the chat. So ways to engage people in collective um, doing, doing something collectively. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm already talking, speaking about the... Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Weaving connections. Weaving yeah. connections. So we we do a lot of small groups, pairs. In Zoom, you can do uh, separate rooms, right? Um, and having time and listening for people in the whole group as well. 
and we try to don't speak a lot uh, as we're doing here for 15 minutes. Usually we try to speak like five minutes or less and then invite people to uh, check how is it landing for you? Is, is something coming up? How uh, there's some insight or something happening? And also interchanging, like I speak for three minutes and Yuri for three minutes and then me for three minutes, like not one person with a monologue because I, in our experience also, it has been more difficult to be, to pay, pay attention online than it is in person, right? So we really try to mix a lot of things like doing pairing up, engaging people to talk and putting uh, in pairs and small groups and, and um, yeah, just adding maybe that a lot of that architecture comes from the art of hosting conversations that matter mm -hmm. and the idea of how, how do we there. decentralize the conversation in ways uh, and, and also the experiencing in ways that it doesn't um, continuously revolve just around us as the center. So the idea of going to small groups and, and pairs to exercise and then to other small groups to harvest and kind of process what was that experience like and then come back to the main group and then register again, harvest again, what, what were the main learnings or insights um, helps, helps uh, create those one-on-one -on -one connections that are so much more difficult to happen in a larger group and it kind of dissolves a little bit the experience of being in front of a screen and so many pictures and i'm kind of powerless uh, not wanting to take space in that environment there, there are so many things that are happening um in this structure that i i i don't even i'm not even sure that i know how many of those are happening so uh, but I'm, but I'm always um, trying to be aware. There's a lot that's happening here that is preventing people of feeling the group. And so somehow, over a few hours, right at the beginning, we start already feeling a, a transformation in a sense of sensing a group-like energy. There's something that shifts, and people, you, it's not us that say that. Usually, people in their feedback um, verbalize that. But there's there was something different in what we were doing. This I felt it different. It wasn't like a usual Zoom course or something. And that's so satisfying, actually, to feel that some of the face-to-face -face experience is, is pouring over to, to, the, to the digital um, format. And, and, and sometimes it's even a deeper connection between people can go deeper because people are in their own homes. And you see like a cat coming on top of the, the, the lap of the person, for example, or kids and people who work together, for example, and they don't have this uh, close connection. Now they are starting uh, to have, and it's, um, so it's, a, it's something else that, that sometimes you can have deeper connections uh, because it is online and acknowledging uh, it and, and welcoming it as well in the sense that people don't feel awkward or somehow that that they're they've done something wrong because their cat appeared in the front of the screen or their kids came running in and grabbed them and so we're just you know attempting to really bring a sense of oh they're all welcome welcoming and, everything that comes yeah. up it doesn't <laughs> matter what so this is Something really there, important. There's another aspect of co-facilitation also that I want to mention for those who who um, deal with that or or um, haven't considered maybe that format. That it could be there are challenges, but there are also great great advantages. For example, if one of us is holding the space of um, talking to a particular subject or responding to a person or an issue that just rose up. The other one is really scanning the group and trying to check in for uh, just checking for signals and what is happening with people. And it's really helpful to have someone noticing if there are signals or something, emotion came up, for example, and you might want to check in with the person. Um, is everything okay? Do you, do you need um, anything? Do you need uh, to, do, would you like to talk about something or have some support? And also, we, we always have a tech support besides the two of us, someone who's caring for the organizing small groups and checking other things uh, that we might not see, like just the technical aspects. Another thing is yeah. that was Which... spoken 
previously before? No, just to say that it frees a lot of the focus for facilitation yeah. if we're not having to deal with the technical issues. So this, the, we had to learn that the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. We, we also start before, before a group starts or before uh, we start something with a group, we send uh, a video of, of us, a welcoming video, a video with us presenting ourselves. Uh, and um, we create a WhatsApp group or a group in some other platform, Slack, for example, we use with uh, um, with Ready one? School. With oh. Ready School, oh, yeah. uh, Slack and things that uh, can, where people can connect other than in the, the meeting with us. And uh, so, so it's another plat channel, platform, yeah. another channel where people can talk about uh, other things um, um, as questions and, and connect. Um, what else? I wrote down a few things. And here. we usually also invite people to do um, offline, out, uh, not offline, mm -hmm. they're still online, but they're outside of the course environments to do practices that um, re um, revolve around and have opportunities to practice what we're looking at in the course. So small groups and depending on which course we're offering, we work with small groups, with pairs, empathy buddies or things like that that happen outside of the course environment. So there's also that element that increases the, the, the level of cohesiveness and depth of experience for people. And it translates into the quality of presence that definitely impacts in how people are present in front of the screen. And, and there, there are groups that are for almost a year, they continue um, uh, meeting up after, after the, the, uh, the course with us, they, are continue, they continue meeting and, and doing the yeah. amongst themselves. So what, it's really- One thing that I'm thinking of that is also important maybe to mention that in transferring to online format, we noticed how people, mainly when we're working with organizations, when we're offering courses to uh, government or different government branches or large corporations, what happens is that it, in most of these environments, people culturally haven't really adapted the organizational culture to the difference between what it is to attend physically a course and what it is to attend a course online. And what happens usually is that as a pattern, and we've seen it in Brazil and other countries, is that people um, don't, they don't notify their department or their team that they're out for a training. They, they, because it's on their computer and all their life is on the computer and all the projects and meetings and everything else is happening on the same computer, they think they can do everything at the same time. And that really impacts the quality of so uh, presence and attention. And there's just hasn't been kind of a preparation of, of translating that shift. And so what we've learned over time is that we try to prepare people by sending out uh, preparatory emails where we make it very clear that this is, uh, this is the same as a face-to-face -face course. You won't be able to engage in other things while you're with us. Um, we really recommend you set that time aside so people can prepare. prepare and really emotionally actually prepare, but also how they're imagining what, what's going to happen. So it's not a shock when it does happen. And even with that preparation, a lot of people just glaze over the email and don't really, don't really read it. And then they have that shock that they're unable to do the workshop, which is very interactive and do something else at the same time. It's just not possible. So they learn the hard way, but we're, we're doing our best to prepare people so for their presence. I think we probably might want to open to some questions now because there's we're, a, there's we have another four, thing. We there's just a, have four minutes. Just ah, so you know. We 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 also bring like short videos and um, some slides, some other other things that um, to to change um, to change uh, what's the name. Um, to don't do always the same thing as we are doing here, actually. I'm very uncomfortable doing that. Just, uh, just lecturing, speaking. just speaking nonstop. Yeah. 
Okay, right. so we're gonna stop here. Yeah. Is that, is that a, did you wanna? I think is there so. Anything I think else? it's. Yeah. If there's any questions or comments or how it's landing for you or. Yeah, we'd love to hear feedback in all kinds of forms. Questions or just comments. So while we're just waiting for the questions to come in in the chat, I can definitely say that the Ready School really, really enjoyed um, the 20 hour nonviolent communication course that we did with Yuri and Sandra earlier this year. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anyone get, I think, five start from pretty much every person who participated. Um, and this is not paid advertising. This is just uh, from heart to heart. You did an absolutely amazing job and we can't wait to con continue the good work with you. Um, Thank you, Anne. It was just really lovely to work with, with Ready School's team. Mm -hmm. It was just such a connecting experience for us as well. So an amazing we work. really celebrate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> lovely to hear. All right. So if you have questions, Feel free to put them in there. Here we go. So, Renaldo, um, also from Brazil. So maybe you want to unmute yourself and ask the questions. Lovely to have many people from Brazil here today. How is reading the room online different from doing it face to face? Yeah, much more yeah. challenging because it's more difficult to see the the um, face faces, uh, facial yeah expressions, and also the. Um, yeah, but there are things, for example, if I notice someone is uh, saying something and I'm just remember one situation, for example, the person wrote something down on the chat and telling up, talking about something uh, personal, deep, deeper. And I, I invited this person to speak if they wanted to speak. They said, no, I don't want to, to talk about this. I don't want to say it out loud. Okay, so then, but she continued chatting, uh, writing it down. This was while I was facilitating While Yuri something. was speaking, doing yeah. other, other things. And then this person closed their camera. And so I, I was co-facilitating. So I, I started talking to this person aside. And I was with this person for a while until, so she, could came, uh, come back to the to the group. She wasn't. She was uh, dealing with something personal, very intense. So I was there with her, with empathy with her for for a little bit, and in a separate group. This is like an extreme situation. Like let's say not extreme, but mm -hmm. just something that I picked up. Something's going on here, and then the person came back to the to, to, and she she was thinking about leaving the meeting, leaving the course. And in the end, she stayed and she really enjoyed it. But mm -hmm. it's much more challenging to do that in person, uh, yeah, in, online. In, in person, maybe that person would have left the room and would have gone to the bathroom, for example. So in this case, as we are two, one of us can go check on the person to see what's going on. Because we're dealing with what we deal with is with very uh, tender or sensitive things, many ways, some uh, inner processes, and sometimes it's it's um, very challenging, mm -hmm. and people get shy or afraid to speak it in front of everyone. Uh, what else? So we have three more questions, good questions here. So I'm just going to read them out loud to you. Um, we are also running a little bit short on time, but Ole is asking, what is an example of nonviolent communication in a remote meeting? And what does not work in nonviolent communication online? Um, from a violent communication or a nonviolent communication? I don't know. So, so, or maybe only you want to <laughs> unmute yourself and ask the question. Well, I think it's a little so nonviolent communication. That's what you're about. Uh, what is like you know, violent communication? How 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 that unfolds? You you want to encourage the opposite. But uh, if I was to get some advice from you, and what what should I not try to do uh, when it comes to that kind of communication in meetings? Because there's something that can't be resolved. Uh, and then others like what what works, uh, except what doesn't work when you're in that explosive um, area. 
the the answer to this question is much longer than than we have the time. I I just want to say that we don't consider nonviolent. <clears throat> as the opposite of violent. That's the first thing, and it's a deep philosophical conversation around it. But, the, but I could say that if you, what you're calling violent maybe would be an interaction that causes disconnection rather than contributes to connection. And um, I, would, I, would, I would also, I would refer that back to when I'm in reactive mode. If I'm in reactive mode, there is a high chance of creating disconnection. If I'm able to, to just find ways to have more self-knowledge, self-awareness, um, just know myself, each one, each one of us have, have our own triggers, our own history, our own trauma, whatever it is that's appearing, that's showing up when I'm facilitating. If I know what to do when that shows up and not be in reaction, but be in presence and be able to receive what's coming up and respond from a present place that has higher chances to keep to care for connection but it's so much more than that well so i don't know if yes. you want to say something <laughs> so in um in in non-violent communication at least in the way i see it i we don't consider anything a violent communication i can i can receive with empathy anything if i'm uh if i'm centered or if i'm willing to or if i'm able to so but there are things that maybe you're talking about how i um the ways i want to communicate in a way that will more probably not be received as violent for uh, other people maybe that's the so yeah okay I w i'd so love to is... talk to you more another <laughs> time about this if you if you're uh want to <laughs> all right yeah, there are things we like are... Uh, wait, I, I, okay, okay. So, so i have to be the, the strict timekeeper now just to make sure that we, our next speaker is also having a bit of time there are some really good questions in the chat so maybe if you uh, on the side can also uh, answer some of them in the actual chat then then we don't miss some of your your great insights but uh let's give yuri and sandra a round of digital applause Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So now we are moving across continents and uh, moving on to, I believe, Denmark. Mm -hmm. Ui, are you with us now? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Cool. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for this beautiful invitation. First to you, Anne and to Andy and Ole and Sandra and Yuri. I'm very grateful that, I mean, we are in line or in circle and that I'm going to build upon what you have just been telling. I've actually prepared a slideshow. So, um, I, and so I will share that with you. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I've been asked to speak about presence in the digital room and how you can transfer your presence from the normal room into the digital room. And I'm also part of the CARES pilot community. I'm not a CARES pilot myself, but I have taught at the CARES pilot for many, many, many years. Um, and now I have co-founded a company called Emerging Earth together with some CARES pilots where we are we're sitting in circle all the times, taking decision all the times in circle. So <clears throat> with everything that that takes. Cool. My intention is to give a brief introduction to the mindset of the present facilitator. So how are you present in a room like this? Uh, how, what do you do? How do you do it? Um, Yuri and Sandra, you talked about um, how to imagine and you talked about the the quality of uh, the present quality of the facilitator, the state of being of the facilitator. And that is actually what I would like to build upon because that is what presence is about, the state of being. <clears throat> yes. But um, before we start, uh, a good way to, to look into, or, I mean, it, for me, it's like I see a lot of small stamps sitting in there, many different queens and kings sitting on a stamp. And I think the first thing that is important to remember is that I'm you and you are me. 
there was a question in the chat saying, how can you be empathic with somebody who don't even put on their screen? Um, try to remember a time when you didn't feel for putting on your screen. I mean, we all have these moments where you think, no, no, I will check my Facebook, I will go for a cup of coffee, I will do something else. So first of all, to remember that what is in the room is also me and the room is me at the same time. So there's a play going on here. Yes. Um, to be clear, I would like to give a definition of what does facilitate mean. It comes from Latin and it means, means to make easy, to flow or to smooth. And that can actually be a little different sometimes when you are in a digital room because <clears throat> the system is not that smooth all the time. It's a very linear system that you are working in. Presence, that means being with. So when we are present, we are together. We are right here. So presence come from, not from doing, but from being and from your, all, your own state of being when you present or when you facilitate also in the digital room. And as I said, there can be a challenge because you, you're actually doing a dance here. You are dancing between the digital system and a human system. So at one hand, you have a very linear system. And at the other hand, you have a very circular and reflective system. And you have to make that smooth. To have, you have to make that easy to run easy. <clears throat> um, and how do you do that? How do you approach that? And what I would like to do now, and it sounds a little fluffy, and it is, uh, but I would like to make it concrete. I mean, how do you see or how do you approach the digital room in order to be present in here? So how can you shift your mind or how can you consciously use your mind and shift it so that the presence is right here, right now? <clears throat> At the CAS pilot, there's a saying saying when you do processes, it's around being overprepared, understructured, so that you show up with a process design and with an agenda that is not that structured, not too rigid in the structure, but you have your flexibility from, I mean, how prepared and overprepared you are mentally. So you might have a good design, but when you, you know, stand on the floor or facilitate, it is around be it is about being capable of receiving whatever comes and change and dance with it from my perspective if you want to be present in the <clears throat> in the digital room you both have to be over prepared have a lot of mental energy but you also have to be a little over structured um, and that itself is somehow a contradiction um, but that is the field that you work in when you want, if you want to be present. <clears throat> but if you do that, if you have a very strict and clear container and you have a plan A and plan B and plan, plan C, and at the same time, you're ready to meet whatever comes, life can unfold inside the digital room. And I think that is what it is about, to make the room vivid and alive. Um, yes. When we look upon the word presence, you could also divide it in another way and then say pre-sense. So, I mean, we have our senses, we have our six senses that we use, you know, and they are alert and alive when you're present. I mean, you are here with everything you are, but I think around present as before I can come into that state of being, there's a pre-state like a pre prototype. There's another state before being able to sense. And what I do is that here I've taken a picture of a photo of some snow. I try to imagine what, what has the snow like, what has it been like before it was snow? How did it go from water into snow? Which cycles has, has it been through? And it is the same with all you people sitting in here. I've tried to imagine while when I saw you, when you entered the room, what, what did she do before? What did he do before? Where do they come from? 
which kind of coffee do they drink? Do they prefer tea? So I try in order to become present to imagine what has happened before this moment in order to zoom or dive myself mentally into it. I hope this makes sense. Um, and Einstein, he had said, logic will get you from A to B. You could also say in a process, a good process design will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. So I think when we're talking about presence in a digital room, it is very much about imagining because that is where the magic is lying. So if you want to create magic in a digital room, it is not only about a good process design, it's also around your capacity to imagine what could happen and how it could happen. That is what, that is what uh, can make you reach the stars together with the participants. Um, in all wisdom traditions, no matter if you are a Sufi or you are a Buddhist or also in the Christian wisdom traditions, the first step to become present is to appreciate, to learn to appreciate this very moment. Uh, so in our situation right now, it means that we are, we are gathered here and she somehow called us forward to come in together to this room and just appreciate that this occasion will only happen this only time in our whole life. We will only be here together this only time in our whole life. So just the fact that we open ourselves to appreciate that, to be thankful for that, that is the first step appreciation in order to become present. We could imagine we are facilitating some kind of online training. We get a little annoyed around somebody's late or we get, we get nervous around, you know, our slide that doesn't work, whatever it could be. And suddenly we are out of the now. So instead of getting annoyed, just appreciate that we are here and stick to that. And then from another wisdom tradition, and I think that Yuri and Sandra also came into that, it is around having no attachment when we are here. And how the fuck do you do that? You know, not being attached when your chat doesn't work or something happens. What I do, I say, it just happened. Sometimes actually, um, I don't care. I have a tech host and I hope he or she takes good care of what has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, we take it from there. So it's very much around also not being too rigid yourself. I mean, it happened for a reason, go with it, smile at it. And you, you can always break out people two and two and say, go into a conversation two and two, uh, talk about what you just heard about and nothing happens. So it's very important that you're not too attached to your process design or to the digital framework that you are working with. Trust that it will help you and if not, change it. <clears throat> Uh, I have worked a lot myself. Uh, it, it began at the Chaos Pilot, uh, and then I have had a long journey in working with how can you shift your energy as a facilitator. Um, because I think that what makes a facilitator especially good or sublime is that that you have the cap I mean you have the capacity to shift the energy. So if there's creativity needed in the room, you have to shift into creative energy. If there's a strategic thinking missing in the room, you must shift to um, another energy. Um, and so I've been trained for that for five years in, uh, in a place called, in, in an education called Evocative Leadership Mastery in a Hammer Institute in New Mexico. And I have brought it back to Denmark together with Emerging. So we are working uh, with especially women in circles around how can you shift energy in different areas, areas of your life. <clears throat> so it might sound fluffy, but it is something that you can be taught um, how to work with your presence. Yes. What I also see is uh, my approach into a digital room is that there is a leader in every chair. I think some of you out of hosting people, you have heard that uh, before. Um, but the whole idea around that behind every small screen, there's somebody sitting who would like to lead something and who can make a change out there. So 
not being, what can you say? It's the wrong word, but not being indifferent around that there are, in this call, there's 80 people, you know, just, 80, uh, I mean, 80 people, who are they? I don't know, but I can say in each chair, there's a leader sitting and I can influence them if I bring something and if I'm present in here. So just the fact that you can see all the ripples in the water while you are in here can make you lean a little in knowing I can actually create an impact. It's it's just not, not another Zoom meeting. Yeah. So I'm reminding myself around in order to be present that we are one, but we are not the same. Right now, we are connected. And if we all lean in with our presence, we can actually create something together. Because I think that right now um, in the world, there's a, there's a deep yearning and call and longing for belonging to something, to be part of different kinds of communities. From my perspective, we are reorganizing the world right now, uh, the whole world. And one way to do it is to do, as we're just doing today, that we meet in, in digital platforms where we can participate from all over the world. Um, and if you look at the word belonging, there's also being energy in there. So if you want to unfold people's belong longings, it is important that you can be together with them. <clears throat> That's first step, then we can act together with them afterwards. Um, yes, because what I hear right now in the world is that something wants to be born. There's a call for reorganizing new kind of leadership. Um, and there are so many people that for many, many years have been, what do you say, uh, been, I can't find the word, for many years, you know, who, who haven't felt that they were part of the society. But from my perspective, they are seed, seeds for a new way of organizing our common life here on Earth. And I think that the digital platforms can help us, can help, help us if we use them in a good way. So we actually have the structure. It is laid out for us. We have, I mean, we can connect now. We can speak to each other what we're, like we're doing right now. So what I think is very important is that we all put on our, our shoulders that leadership is not a position. It is not around whether you are CEO or whether you yeah, have the right title. I mean, leadership is around walking in life and a way that you can organize and lead are in these digital platforms if you actually lean in. <clears throat> so actually all of you and all of us we hold the light, we can connect the dots all over the world, and we can choose to be a leader of transformation. That was it. Thank you so much, Kurt. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, I could hear when you were talking about appreciation and gratefulness, it really resonated and gave me a deep sense of calm and connection so it's wonderful to have you here um we are now open for questions also andy is saying beautiful thank you so much in the chat um, so a lot of gratefulness here in the digital space right now if you have questions or comments for Kruik, please put it in the chat or also feel free to unmute yourself more thank you coming in there Hey, Gru, I have a question. Hey. Hi. Saurimas from Team 7. Yes, I know. Yes, hello. And now also teaching a change course in Sweden. But I have a question for you, like very good memories from your classes in Chaos Pilots. And I've, mentioned, I've noticed that you're very good at bringing the presence, but also keeping the structure and the frames. How do you combine those two things? Because structure and frames and things it seems mm. that there one is from the mechanistic uh, business world and the other one is nearly from spiritual. So any secret how to combine these two? Oh, you got it. Um, yeah, I, I want to be very frank with all of you and say, even though that I facilitated now for 20 years, every time I also did it for this meeting, I do an Eduard. I do it every time. So I use, I mean, that structure. So I know... 
so that I have a feeling of that I'm secure. And it might change when I open the room or when I go in on the floor and facilitate. Um, and then I put, yeah, and that goes with shifting the energy, but, and then I just align myself into that we are all connected. That is where I begin. Uh, when, when I open the floor or when I open this digital room. Um, yeah, let me see if I can explain this. Um, it's a little difficult. So it is around when you are in a room and that, that when you trust, when you begin that we are connected. Then when I meet resistance or when people are like, she's a little strange, she's, you know, I just embrace it. And as I just said around empathy, I just uh, remind myself when I am against something and I often am, I'm not walking around in peace all the time. You could imagine, but I'm not. Um, so, so, so it is very much around trusting the connection that, uh, and at the same time, I, I'm never sloppy with my I do art. I do it strictly every time because that also make myself mentally prepared somehow. I don't know Arimus, if that was answer enough. You know. Yes, thank you. Oliver here, I have a question. When you said in the beginning that it's important, can you hmm? hear me? Okay. Yes. That it's important normally to be over- um, Over prepared, um, under structured. Under structured, but you said yeah. online, it's over prepared and over structured, first of all, why do you think so? And second, what do you mean by it exactly? Yes. I would like to explain that. Maybe, Anna, can you write it in the chat? Hmm? Overprepared, understructured actually come from the chaos pilots. So when you are taught around how you facilitate and how you do a process design, you know, pro process design is somehow when you plan yourself and um, facilitation is when you stand there in the moment, you know, facilitating, make things run. Then it is important that when you are over, it, it often we are over planned. We have planned everything. Mm -hmm. They have to sit like this. We have to use yellow posts. You know, you plan and you plan and you plan and you plan. And you're so detailedly planned. So when you then meet the room and come in, you know, somebody don't like yellow post-its and everything breaks down. You don't know what to do. Um, so it's better to say, I have a plan, I'm structured, but I spent the majority of my energy and time in preparing myself mentally so that I can meet whatever come in a nice way uh, so that the flow keep on flowing in the room instead of me getting like you know, you can get nervous and you don't know what to do when people don't like what you have prepared. That is, that is the whole idea. Less planning, more mentally preparation. When you stand on the floor in real life facilitating. And then when you go into uh, digital rooms, and now we imagine that we were going to do a workshop a whole day, or I mean, what I've just done now is a presentation, but a whole collaborative workshop in a digital space then I say you have to be over structured and um, over prepared because you have to be aware of everything that, I mean, if we, if we were going to work with a jam board, for example, or if we were going to work with mural as we're doing here or with a mirror board or something, you have to have all that prepared on beforehand. Um, you all, from my perspective, you also need to have a tech host and the tech host has to know the names and how to get people in and all that. And that is also part of being very, 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 very well planned, you know. So you have a, a very well structured. So you can't say one to one. From my perspective, it takes double or triple time to prepare a good workshop digitally. If it is going to be vivid, efficient, alive, um, so that was the reason why I wrote it. You can't freestyle that much in here. You can try, you know, but you really have to be well, well structured, over structured. I hope that answered your question. Yes. All right, we have time for one more question. Feel hello. free to just, wonderful, Hamza. Yeah, hello. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to know how to pronounce your name first. Uh, okay, we, we will stay yeah. to 10, Hamza. 
Gry. Gry. Okay. Yes. Mm? Perfect. Um, you you ha you have a wonderful perspective, and and I think if people adapt that, adapt that things can move forward much better. But when it comes to mindset, uh, if I can picture that uh, as an equipment, um, I would say that's one of the rarest and uh, uh, most underestimated equipment a human can ha a human have. Uh, the question is, how does someone figure the right mindset and adapt to it? And is there a process uh, to practice in, in which it's possible to help someone with that? I think it's a live question, Hamza, what you are asking now. <laughs> but but I think, and Ole and Andy and Anne, maybe you can also comment. I think I can speak from my own perspective. Um, what I learned at the CARES pilot is I learned to learn somehow. So I learned that life is one long learning process and that I should each day and I should challenge myself in a new way, you know. so. So, so the whole idea of set, it's not like goal setting. It's more like setting, in, setting an intention around what is the next thing that I would like to learn so that you somehow can broaden or expand yourself all the time. Uh, but knowing that, that everything is, that is how I see it, everything is learning. Uh, and I think we were, Oh, I, I can, you cannot say this in English, but we were, we were dandled or we were like Bildung in German. I mean, we were somehow, we were formated like that at the CARES pilot. Um, yeah, so, so it, it's very much around knowing that you can, you can learn until you die. But, but all, already having that approach, you know, is something that, yeah, that I think I was taught there. Sounds great, thank you. Wonderful. So we're getting one minute before closing time. So let's all um, give Gru a warm digital applause. I'm gonna see if I can get it into the gallery view. <laughs> there we go. Really, really nice. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, it would be lovely to get your feedback also in the chat. Um, let us know how this is landing, if you're having some ideas of speakers or if you um, have ideas of how we can improve, feel free to add it in there. Um, really appreciate um, all the time and effort put in by all our truly wonderful speakers today. Um, this is only possible because you are volunteering your time, which I really, really appreciate. Um, and investing into more positive learning experience um, out there. So thank you very much from me for, for being here. Um, I will make sure that I gather all the presentations. I will gather the video as well. I'll make sure that people are connected through the meetup. So um, with that, thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening or a wonderful morning or a wonderful, um, I don't know, night, <laughs> wherever you might be joining from. It is absolutely beautiful to feel that we are one global family in this. So thank you very much for joining and stay safe and stay healthy during Corona. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for organizing. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for attending and presenting. Bye.